we've, we're focusing on web security, and we went through that one aspect of web security is HTTPS. And normally, when we're using web browsing, we're using HTTP as the application layer protocol. And a HTTP message, like a GET request, is created by your web browser on the left protocol stack. In the normal case, that HTTP GET request is sent to the TCP software in your operating system, which creates a connection to the web server, SYN, SYN ACK, ACK with TCP, and then sends that HTTP request to the web server. And eventually, the response comes back using TCP. Now, of course, all of that is insecure. Nothing's encrypted, and we don't know for sure that we're talking to the right web server. What HTTPS does, it, it introduces the use of a, a, a layer or a, a, a protocol between HTTP and TCP. So your browser generates the same HTTP request, a GET request, Instead of sending it direct to the TCP software in the operating system, on the right picture, we see that HTTP sends it to the SSL software on your computer. SSL is the secure sockets layer, also called transport layer security, TLS. HTTP request is sent to the secure sockets layer, which then establishes a secure connection to the server. And we saw an example last lecture uh, in Wireshark that the secure, cell, secure sockets layer protocol has some steps of establishing a secure connection, negotiating which algorithms we're going to use to encrypt and, and to authenticate, and then encrypting the data. So SSL does the security functionality Everything is still sent using TCP from browser to web server, but everything inside the TCP packet, once the secure cell, shell, secure shell, secure sockets layer connection is established, everything inside the TCP packet is encrypted. So HTTPS is simply HTTP using SSL. HTTPS on its own is not a separate protocol. It's, it just introduces SSL. Or sometimes TLS is the newer version. So we can encrypt our data. But one of the problems that we have is that to encrypt data, we would like to use symmetric key encryption, because it's generally faster than public key encryption. So to encrypt data with symmetric key encryption, both your web browser and web server need to have a shared secret key. So that's the challenge. How does your web browser and web server get a key that they both know so that they can encrypt the data? What's the answer? How do we exchange? How did the browser and the server get some random key that they both know? Remembering we cannot send a key across the network unencrypted. If I send my key, let's say, from the server chooses a key, sends it to the browser unencrypted, the attacker can intercept and see my key. So that doesn't work. So we need to encrypt the key to send it across the network. Encrypt the key using what? We use public key encryption to encrypt the key. And then once we've got this key at the, say, at both sides, then we'll use that key to use symmetric key encryption. Why use a combination? Symmetric key encryption is much faster. So we'll encrypt the key using public key encryption, encrypt all of our data, and there's usually a lot of data, using symmetric key encryption. So we'll look at how that's done, and we'll look at some of the problems that arise with that. So when we want to provide encryption in web browsing, and also authentication, it's not just a key for encryption. I would also like to know for sure that the other side I'm communicating with is the web server corresponding to the domain www.facebook.com. It's not someone pretending to be that web server. 
So that's the authentication part of it. The problem is the browser and server do not have pre-shared secrets. My browser doesn't have a key which is also known by the server. We need to exchange that secret. So the way that we do it is we use public key cryptography to securely exchange a secret key. And there are different public key cryptographic uh, schemes. Some of them are listed here. RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve cryptography. I just list them because when we look at some real examples, you'll see their names come up. So that, there are different ways to do it. We'll use a simple example, uh, let's say using RSA. Public key crypto is used to exchange a secret key. Once both sides have a secret key, then they can use the faster symmetric key encryption to exchange data. Encrypt the data with, let's say, AES and our shared secret key, send it to the other side, which can decrypt. And it's maybe tens of, if not hundreds of times faster to do symmetric key encryption, thousands in some cases. So that's the approach. But it turns out there's a problem with that approach. So let's illustrate the approach and then we'll analyze the problem. So I'll draw what the typical, the, the aim is in this case, and then we'll see well, what could go wrong in that. So the idea is that we have browser and server and with public key encryption we assume, let's assume that the server has its own key pair. So a server has its key pair I'll denote as the public key of S, the server, and the private key of S, the server. The browser may also have a key pair, but we don't really need it in this case. We mainly use it for, from the server, so we'll see how it's used. So that's known at the front by the server. It has its own key pair. They don't have a shared secret yet. Our aim is to get a shared secret. So one approach is that we send a message from server to browser and that message contains the public key of the server. Remember, for confidentiality using public key cryptography, we encrypt with the other person's public key. Right? So if the server has a public key, PUS, in this case, the server sends its public key to the browser because the browser doesn't have it yet. The browser is just visiting the website for the first time. It doesn't know the public key of that website. So in some exchange, the server would, may send its public key to the browser. And now, the browser can generate a shared secret key, choose a random number, which it's going to use later for encryption, and send that secret key back to the server, but of course encrypted, encrypted using public key crypto. So the next step, the browser generates a key, let's say a shared secret key, K, shared between the browser B and the server S and sends back a response and the response includes the key but we can't send it in the clear so we must send it encrypted using the public key of the server
And when we encrypt with the public key of the server, when the server receives this message, it can decrypt because the server knows the private key of S, no one else does, and hence we have confidentiality for that key transfer, the key exchange. When the server receives that second message, it decrypts and it learns KBS. Now we know that this is public key encryption because I denote that the key being used is a public key, but just to be clear, this E here is public key encryption. We've completed the key exchange. The browser and the server now have a shared secret, KBS. So now the data that goes between the browser and server can be encrypted with KBS. And it can go in either direction using that same key. So we exchanged the secret, now we have some data to send, like the HTTP request and the response. In both directions, we may send messages, and we will encrypt the messages using the shared secret key KBS, whatever data we want to send. And this algorithm for encryption is using symmetric key. That's the idea with public key encryption to exchange a key and then symmetric key encryption to encrypt the data. Of course, there may be many packets going back and forth containing data, all encrypted using KBS. This is a common technique for exchanging keys followed by encrypting with symmetric key ciphers. Any questions on how this works? Can someone learn KBS? Someone other than the browser and server learn the shared secret key KBS? What would you need to do as an attacker to learn this KBS? Um, impersonate. impersonate who? The receiver. If we could impersonate, we'll see the server, then maybe we can. So, of course, if we intercept these three messages, if I'm the attacker, I intercept uh, the first one, I learn the public key of the server. Uh, who cares? It's public anyway. That doesn't help me. If I intercept the second one, I can't decrypt it because I don't have the private key of the server. So that's no help to me as an attacker. And if I intercept the third message or any of the encrypted data, again, I can't decrypt because I don't know KBS because KBS was exchanged using the public key encryption. So just intercepting these messages doesn't help the attacker. But there is an attack that involves the attacker impersonating the others. And it's referred to as a man in the middle attack. What the attacker will do is be in the middle of the, the path between browser and server, intercept messages before they get to the destination, modify them, and forward them on. And the idea is that the attacker, the man in the middle between browser and server, will impersonate the server from the perspective of the browser and impersonate the browser from the, the perspective of the, the server. Let's see how it works, and then we'll look at what we need to do to overcome that. So, right, that was what we're trying to draw, and now we're going to try and draw, well, what can go wrong in that exchange, a man-in-the-middle attack? We'll 
start again, but we'll introduce the, the third entity. We have browser. Server. And the man in the middle, or a woman in the middle, is the attacker. And in the middle, it means that they can intercept messages between browser and server, so maybe somewhere on the path in the internet, and they can modify those messages as well. Not just intercept, but also modify. So what the browser and server do, they follow the steps from the previous diagram, those same three steps, but the attacker will make some changes along the way. So again, what's known up front, the server has a public key and a private key. And the server, the browser doesn't know the public key of the server, so the server sends its public key to the browser. That's the first step. But it's going to be intercepted by the attacker. So the normal message sent, PUS is sent from server to browser. But the attacker intercepts that and then forwards a message onto the browser with a modified public key. Can the attacker read this value? Can the attacker read PUS? Yes, it's not encrypted. It's just sent in the plain text. So they see a public key. All right, they know it's from the server. It's a public key of the server. What the attacker does is changes the value to their own public key. Because it's not encrypted, and in this case we have no authentication techniques, the attacker can make a change without anyone knowing. It changes the public key in this message and changes it to its own, the public key of the attacker. And just to be clear, we should have said that the attacker also has its own key pair. Anyone can have their own key pair. So it's a message that was intercepted Maybe the from is still from the server, the destination is still the browser, but the contents has been changed to be the public key of the attacker. Any questions on the first attack step? What are you going to do next? A question? Yeah? Right. The when I say the attacker intercepts and modifies, when the browser receives PUA, they still think it's from the server. With respect to HTTP, then the browser has made a TCP connection to the, the, the server already. So when it receives the message, it thinks, based on the IP address, maybe it's a fake IP address, it still thinks it's from the server, has no way of knowing whether it is indeed the correct public key or it's the public key of A. Because you just receive a message ah, from the server, public key, it must be the server's public key. What happens next? What does the browser do? It follows the normal steps, it chooses a, a secret key, encrypts. So the browser thinks everything's okay, they generate a secret KBS and they send the response back to the server and the response is using the public key we just received thinking it's the public key of the server, but in fact it's the public key of A, encrypting KBS. Send that back to the server, 
again our attacker intercepts. Before it gets to the server, we, as the attacker, receive this message. Can the attacker decrypt? Encrypted with PUA, the attacker knows PRA, therefore, yes, the attacker can decrypt. And the attacker learns KBS. So we have a problem, but our attack's not finished yet. The attacker has learned this secret key, KBS. But for the attacker to be successful, they must make the browser and server think that they've set up a secure connection. So we continue. We forward a message onto the server. because it's, the server is expecting a response. It said it's public key, it's expecting an encrypted shared secret to come back. So the attacker encrypts using PUS KBS. The attacker knows KBS, they know PUS, it's a public key of the server they received in the first message. They encrypt that and send it back to the server. And the server receives what it expects. The server sent its public key to the browser. The server receives a response encrypted using its public key of some secret. They decrypt because they know PRS and they learn KBS. The server now has KBS. And the key exchange is finished. The key exchange was send the public key, receive an encrypted shared secret key, KBS. And neither the server nor the browser know that something's gone wrong. The server sent a public key, received a, a valid response. The browser received a public key, sent a valid response. What happens next? To finish this attack, how does the attacker take advantage of it? What does the browser do now? Let's say now the browser and server have exchanged a secret, so they start sending data to each other. The browser sends data to the server, and also on the other direction. Let's consider from first the direction of, it doesn't matter which direction, let's say the data is sent from browser to server, maybe the HTTP GET request. We're using symmetric key encryption. We encrypt using the shared secret key, KBS, some data. The browser sends that to the server, but again, our attacker intercepts. Can the attacker decrypt? Yes. Encrypted with KBS, the attacker knows KBS, so the attacker learns the data. They learn the data, and to make the browser and server think that everything is okay, they send it on to the server. The same encrypted data, or they could modify the data if that's their aim. server gets the data, the browser has sent the data, but unfortunately the attacker also gets the data. So everything sent between browser and server, and similar in the other direction, is intercepted by the attacker and they can decrypt 
all of that data. So this is our man in the middle attack. The man in the middle, the attacker, has pretended to be the browser and server and in doing so learned the shared secret key KBS and therefore can decrypt all the data. They can decrypt data, they can modify data and it go undetected because they know the keys now. This is a problem. Any questions about the man in the middle attack? How to conduct it? Okay. What went wrong? Why, why was the attack successful? What's the, the, the problem with what the browser and server did? They, they used the same key, all right, but what, what, was, what led to the problem that the attacker learnt KBS? What was the step here that was the, the, the flaw in this, this protocol for exchanging a secret? Which one do you think is the problem? Public key of... The public key of the server was sent in that very first message. The server sent its public key to the browser. The problem was the attacker intercepted that and changed it to another one without the browser knowing. That's the problem. The browser receives a public key saying this is the public key of the server but it's in fact the public key of the attacker. And when the browser encrypts something using this public key it's not aware that the attacker is going to be able to decrypt it. So the real prob problem here is receiving a public key without having to without being able to verify that it is indeed the public key of the server. We need a way so that the server can send its public key to the browser. When the browser gets it, the browser can check and confirm for sure that this public key is that of the server. It's not one of the attacker. How can we do that? How can we send a, uh, some value, the public key in this case, such that the receiver can confirm for sure that it is indeed from this server? A signature. We need the server to sign the message or someone to sign the message to, to confirm this is indeed the public key of the server. Now the server signing the message won't help. If the server signed the message with its private key, then the browser would need the public key of the server to verify. But our problem is that the browser doesn't have the public key of the server. If the browser knew the public key of the server, we would have no problem. So what we do, because when you open your browser, you visit a new website, you don't have the public key of that website. You've never been there before. Their public key uh, may change on a regular basis. So we need some way to distribute that public key, but we need it to be signed. So what we do is we get someone else to sign it. We get someone else to sign the public key of the server saying this is the public key of the server. When the browser gets that signed public key, the browser verifies using that someone else's public key that it is indeed the, the real public key of the server. So the signed public key we'll see is a certificate. We'll see the steps for signing it in a moment but we'll, we'll introduce the, the a little bit more detailed terminology and uh, notation. So the man in the middle attack is the problem here. It allows us the attacker to discover and decrypt all the data. So for web security we need something more than what we did in our protocol. We need some signature and the 
The signed public keys will refer to as certificates, or digital certificates. So the step, the server creates a key pair, P-U-S, P-R-S, like in our initial step, we needed a, a public key pair. But then what the server does is the server contacts some other entity, we'll call a certificate authority, CA for short, and this certificate authority will sign the public key of the server. The idea is that the authority confirms this is the public key of the server. When the browser receives this signed certificate, it can verify it's the correct public key. How do we sign something? So the approach is that we're going to sign the public key of the server. How do we sign a, a value? Write an equation for signing the public key of the server. Hash? Hash of what? Remember how we do a digital signature? What do we do? We covered it in the previous lecture. Hash of the data and then encrypt the hash value with private key of the signer. Okay, so we, we hash the public, public key in fact, here what we want to do is not just hash the public key. What we want to do is include the identity of the server, something that IDs or, or unique, uniquely identifies the server. So the concept we'll see is that we hash, we have the make some more space, the concept of signing We'll see a little bit more detail for a certificate, but the concept is that we have the identity of the server. How can we identify a web server? What thing do we commonly use to identify a web server? If I wanted you to tell me about the Facebook web server, what address would you tell me is that of the Facebook web server? Tell me louder. What's what's the name of the Facebook web server? Not Facebook. There's a bit, little bit more precise. Facebook.com. Okay. Or www.facebook.com. A domain name. All right. Web servers are identified by domain names. So when I say the ID of the server, in practice we'll see it's a domain name. So the ID of the server is combined with the public key of the server. This just means concatenate or combine them together, join them together. So we have a domain name, for example, and a public key of the server. We want to sign that. And remember, to sign something, we calculate the hash of that. And then we encrypt the hash value. With a private key. Example of the ID. The example of the public key I will not write but uh, it could be a, you've generated in one of your homeworks, say, a, a 2048-bit RSA key. One of your homeworks, you generated your, your public-private key pair. So that's what would be included here, the public key of the Facebook web server. Now we will add one more item to what we sign. 
with a public key, they may change over time. So a public key has a, a lifetime. So I may generate a public key today, and maybe it has a lifetime for one year, and one year later, I'll need to generate a new public key. So we'll say that we'll include another piece of information, a timestamp, or some time information about, I'll just denote it as T here, the timestamp. For example, it may include the start date and the end date of this key. In other words, this public key, this 2048-bit RSA key, belongs to Facebook, or more precisely, www.fb.com, in my example, and this key is valid from this start date and up until this end date. Don't trust it before the start date. Don't trust it after the end date. So we have a period of, uh, that it's valid for. So I just denote that in short as the timestamp T. So that's the main information that we need to sign. This would be generated by the web server. It knows its own domain name. It generates its own public key. It knows it sets a start and end date. We calculate the hash of all that information and then encrypt that with a private key. Whose private key? When we want to sign something, we use the sign as public key. Who's going to sign? Let's consider, what if the server signs this public key? So if the server signed their own public key, then we've got two problems. One is that the browser doesn't know the public key of the server to verify. That was our problem. The browser doesn't yet know the public key of the server. If something is signed by the private key of the server, we will need the public key of the server to verify that, but we don't have that. So we can't verify it. And in fact, if it was signed by the private key of the server, there's nothing to stop to someone else to create this signature. Maybe Steve comes along, says the ID of my ID is www.facebook.com. I generate my own public key. It's definitely not Facebook's. And I sign it myself. Then there's no way to, to, for the receiver to be sure that it came from Facebook or me. So we can't self-sign. Here we need to sign by someone else. So we sign by what we call an authority or a certificate authority to be precise. Someone else signs this. I'll denote the private key of the CA. The certificate authority maybe it's also a this is This is also maybe a 2048-bit RSA key, the private key, but of a certificate authority. That's the general name. And in fact, we'll see that later there are different companies and organizations that act as certificate authorities. One of them you may see that comes up. VeriSign is one. Komodo, many others. We'll talk about them later. So the idea here is that the server is going to send its public key to the browser. 
That was the very first step that we needed. The server sends its public key to the browser, but with the man in the middle attack, the attacker can modify it to anything it likes. That's the problem. To overcome that problem, the server is not going to send the public key on its own. It's going to include its ID, its timestamp, and get that public key signed by someone else. This someone else is called a certificate authority. And the idea will be, when we send this signed value to the browser, the browser will be able to verify that it came from, or it is that of the server, as long as it has the public key of the authority. This part is the signature. I'll just denote. The signature component is here. And normally we don't just send a signature, we send the real data with the signature attached. Questions on how we generate this signature? When you access a game, when you're uh, using Line or, or Facebook on a mobile app, if they're using HTTPS, they are obtaining this signature all the time. Because your browser or your application doesn't know whether you're communicating with the right server or not. Any questions on how to generate the signature? The signature here is the ID of the server, the public key of the server, some time values or timestamps signed by someone else. So we need to talk about who that someone else is in a moment, but let's call them the certificate authority. What we do this sign value, which I just wrote down, is this component here. Timestamp, public key of the server, ID of the server, hashed, encrypted with the private key of the CA, that's the signature component. And we, of course, attach the signature to the data. The data was the ID, the public key, and the timestamp. All together, see there are four parts. ID, public key, timestamp, signature. All together, what is that called? What do we call it? What do we call CS? CS, what is it? A very important part in web security. When you set up your own website, you must generate this. CS is what we call the certificate of server S. It contains the server's identity, like their domain name, their public key, some timestamps saying how long this certificate is valid for, and this part at the end is the signature of all of those three data elements. This certificate of the server is signed by who? Who signed this, the certificate? Who signed CS? Have a look, it's in there somewhere. Who signed it? Who signed CS? Have a look on the, the equation there. Don't say server, it's wrong. What's a signature mean? Encrypt with... Encrypt the hash with which key? Private key of the signer. So who signed CS? CA, the certificate authority. So be careful here. It's the public key of the server signed by the authority, the certificate authority in long. 
It's like you coming to me and saying, here is my public key, and I sign it as the authority confirming, yes, this is your public key, and now you have a certificate, and you can go to other people, those other people that trust me, they see my signature, know it's your public key. And that's how we'll use it in web security. So we say that the certificate of the server is issued by the authority, the certificate authority. This is the concept. There's a more detailed specification of the format of such certificates. The, the standard for what to include here, it's more than just these values, and it has a particular structure, is referred to as X509. We will show you some real certificates later, but, uh, and we'll see they're in X509 format, but the concept is captured by this one. Let's see how it works with respect to our browser and server. We have our browser, server, We will not show the attacker yet. To start, the server has a certificate. And it's a, denoted as, we'll write it in full, CS, ID of S. You don't have to write down the full one. It's on your slide, but the public key of S timestamp and encrypted with a private key of CA the hash of what? What's here? These three values. I'll not f squeeze them in there. We take the ID, the public key, and the timestamp. We hash them, encrypt with the private key of the authority. And this is the signature component. This is the data component. That's what the server starts with. And the concept is that we, instead of sending the public key on its own to the browser, we send the certificate instead. What does the browser do when it receives the certificate? The server has just sent its certificate to the browser. What will the browser do? Remember, our aim is like the previous protocol. Exchange a key, KBS. But now we're using a certificate. The certificate contains PUS. That's what we want to learn. The purpose here is for the browser to learn the public key of the server. It's included here. Is the browser sure that this certificate is indeed the certificate of the server and not an attacker? Well, the way that we try to check, if we have a signed value, we verify the signature. How do we verify the signature? Remember back to the basic concepts of a signature, if we sign it with a private key of a user, to verify, we decrypt using the public key of that user. So we try to verify the signature. So the steps we take at the browser, we receive the certificate. And then to verify,
we decrypt using some public key the signed component I'll just write the signature because I can't fit it all in. The signature is this component. Be careful. The encrypted part is the signature. This is the data component. So we take the signature, we decrypt which, with which key? How do I verify this signature? Who signed it? Signed by CA, therefore we should verify with the public key of CA. And here's an important point of the, how certificates are used in web security. The server sends its certificate to the browser. To verify, the browser decrypts the signature part with the public key of the authority. But we have a problem. We meet, need to have the public key of the authority to do this verification. Where do we get the public key of the authority from? Remember our original problem when the server sends its public key to the browser the browser is not sure if it is the public key of the browser or the attacker so we're using a certificate to verify that certificate we decrypt with the public key of the authority therefore we need the public key of the authority where do we get the public key of the authority from we ask the CA to give for the CA to give us its public key. And how do we send public keys now? Instead of sending a public key on its own, what we're going to do is send a certificate. Really, a certificate is a signed public key. The certificate is the public key with some other information confirming by someone else that it's the public key of the server. So, in fact, where do we get the public key of the authority from? We need to get the certificate of the authority. The public key of the authority, we would say, comes from the certificate of the CA. Where do we get the certificate of the CA from? Where do you think it's going to come from? From the CA? What do we do? We send a message to the CA and say, please send us your certificate. They send the certificate of the CA. Who signed the certificate of the CA? The CA signed its own certificate. The problem with signing your own certificate is that you need the public key to verify it. How do you know someone else didn't generate that certificate? We still have the same problem. If we ask the CA for their certificate, then we need the public key of the signer to verify it. We want to verify everything we receive. So we have this recursive problem. To verify the certificate of the server, I need the certificate of the authority. To verify the certificate of the authority, I need the certificate of someone else. But to verify their certificate, I need the certificate of someone else. So we have this recursive problem. To stop that, at some point, we must trust a certificate and not verify it. And in practice, what that means, normally your browser has the certificate of the authority loaded into the browser. When you install your browser on your computer, the creator of the, of the browser loaded in some pre-existing certificates of authorities. And we say that they are trusted. So in this case,
It's trusted or known in advance. The server sends its certificate to the browser to verify we need the public key of the authority or we need the certificate of the authority. Instead of asking the authority for that, the simple approach is we'll assume that the browser already has it. When you installed your browser, it was programmed into it to include some uh, certificates of authorities. In other words, we must implicitly trust this certificate. If we do trust it, then we can verify. And we verify, we find that it, it works, and now we learn the public key of the server, and then we can continue with our other steps of sending the response or the generating KBS. This is the second step of, step of our protocol. And as before, we select a KBS and we encrypt that using the public key of the server. When the authority receives that message, it can decrypt and learn KBS. And then subsequent data can be encrypted using KBS. Let's recap and see what, what we've done and why we did it. So let's go back to the attack. From the start, the normal idea was the server sends its public key to the browser. The browser generates a shared secret key, KBS, and encrypts that using the public key of the server, sends it back to the server, so they both now know KBS. That was our, our approach, but we had a problem. We were subject to a man in the middle attack. If the server sent its public key to the browser, but the attacker intercepted, we had no way for the browser to know if the public key was modified along the way. So the browser may receive a different public key, and if they do, then the attacker can then learn KBS. So the man in the middle attack, the problem was that the received public key was not verified. So the solution we're using, we don't send the public key on its own, we send the signed public key. And the signed public key is referred to as a digital certificate. The public key as well as the identity of the server, the timestamp to, to sh say how long it's valid for, is signed, and a signature is simply hash, encrypt with a private key. We say the public key is signed by an authority. It's the authority confirming this is the true public key of the server. The server therefore sends its certificate to the browser, CS. It includes the public key, but before the browser uses that certificate, the public key, it verifies. And the verification approach involves using the public key of the authority. And at this point, we assume that the browser knows the public key of the authority. It was maybe programmed in the browser, such that they can verify. Once they verify, they know it's the real public key of the server and then can send KBS back encrypted with the public key of the server. And that's the general approach we use in uh, HTTPS, web security, 
we issue certificates to servers and they send the certificate to the browser. Those steps are summarized here. The certificate of the server. The server sends the digital certificate to the browser. The browser verifies the signature using the public key of the CA, but there's a little, a, a little bit of a problem there. To get the public key of the CA, we must have the certificate of the CA, but that needs to be signed by someone. If it's signed by someone else, then we have this recursive problem. At some point, there will be a self-signed certificate. C, the certificate of the CA contains the public key of the CA signed with the private key of the CA. This allows the browser to verify and the browser to get the certificate. 